summer resort area of New York State's Catskill Mountains is virtually paralyzed this weekend by an overwhelming crowd of pop rock music fans from all over the country. At least 300,000 young people, perhaps as many as half a million, have jammed the highways and country roads trying to get to a music festival featuring the most popular performers of rock and folk music. So many people showed up, the festival was declared free and open to everyone. Police say they're amazed at the politeness. There has been virtually no violence. Stop nuclear testing. Three, two, one. Stop nuclear testing. How's the sound, sound person? Sounds groovy. Wow, the sound person, Marlena. Come on down. Hey, Jose. Glad you could be on the show. Good to be here. Well, I want to tell all our folks at home to welcome to Politically Correct Cooking. And as you can tell, we have a real special show. Uh, the show is about uh, the 60s. The show is about uh, peace, love, and... Granola. What granola. else? Granola. <laughs> what else? Now, basically, we're doing a show about the 60s because we want to introduce our audience to some of the crew, also try to find out how the 60s affected us doing what we are doing today. Right. But before we get into all of that really juicy gossip, we want to get into some really juicy granola. Now, what exactly are we going to be doing here? Okay, we're going to be making a recipe that I found in the Farm Vegetarian Cookbook. Now, the farm, for people in the know, is a very special place. Right. The farm is a working cooperative in Tennessee that has existed for a number of years, I think at least 20, and uh, they, it, they're diverse people that live together in harmony. They have their own dwellings, but they have some communal buildings. They have cooperative daycare. They grow their own food. Uh, they are self-sufficient. They market. South American products, I think, a lot of Guatemalan-made ethnic right. things, uh, which they put out in the catalog. Well, actually, uh, the farm being around for as long as it's uh, been, I've, I always meet people in my wanderings, you know, I've been in the farm, or my best friends from the farm, or whatever the case might be, and it seems like, you know, several hundred earth mothers and earth fathers and earth kids, earth dogs and cats, have come from the farm. Exactly. Exactly. Well, what does the farm tell us is the proper way to cook granola? Okay. And if anybody knows how to cook granola, it's the farm people. It would be the farm people. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, pay attention. We are going to start by taking one cup of brown sugar. Okay. And I would want to ask you to get a half cup of lukewarm water. Lukewarm water. And we're going to use that to soften the sugar. Okay. And for those of you that are going to be making granola with us today, you have to get out three cups of rolled oats, one cup of wheat germ, one cup of lightly toasted sunflower seeds, uh, one cup of raisins, a fourth cup of whole wheat or soy flour, one cup of brown sugar, which we're going to soften right now with a half cup of water, okay. a half cup of oil, preferably unsaturated fats. We have our peace oil here today. Oh, good. One teaspoon of salt and one tablespoon of vanilla. Okay. Now, do you know how you can tell this water is from Fairfax County? How's that? It has a light sheen of oil on top. Oh, it's yeah. Not, it's from... Uh, the famous uh, Fairfax oil spill. We don't know which one it is, <laughs> but, you know, just one of the several famous Fairfax so, uh, oil spills. be now, sure to use your water filters right. or buy bottled water. <laughs> Now, stir this? Yes. Okay. That's good. Didn't take so long. Now, what else is on the uh, menu here? Okay, let's just get this out of the way. Okay. And we're going to just basically mix all of our ingredients, which we have pre-measured. Three, three cups of oats? Three cups of oats. Now, these are rolled oats. Rolled oats. Uh, Preferably organic. Now, rolled oats have all the oats in them. There's like, uh, you know, when they process oats or something, they take things out. Rolled right. oats are the total natural goodness right. of 
Grain? Of grain. Grain, okay. Right. Oats is a grain. Okay. Right. Right. Learn something new every okay, day. Okay, far out. <laughs> now. One cup of wheat germ. One cup wheat germ. Mm -hmm. We just throw this together. Right. Okay. It's got a nice smell to it. Do we mix okay. it? Yeah, you mix that. And I'll get the next ingredient, which is a cup of sunflower seeds, lightly toasted, and a cup of raisins. And I've already mixed that together. Oh, you are so efficient. Doggone. Well, I learned something from uh, Liz living communally. Okay. How's my mix in here? Great. So, Jose, what were you doing in the 60s? What was I doing in the 60s? Uh -huh. You don't want to ask. Yeah, I, I just did. <laughs> well, believe it or not, in the 60s, I was um, playing football. I was mm -hmm. an ROTC. Mm -hmm. I was... Uh, a big fan of, jeez, can I even say it? Uh, you had the Democrats with like LBJ, Hubert Humphrey. Mm -hmm. You had the Republicans with Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. And you had those great independents with George Corley Wallace and Curtis LeMay. In 1968, I guess they ran for president. This is the first time I was really politically aware of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a big fan of Curtis LeMay. I liked him. Oh, my him. goodness. Uh, my father was in the Air Force, and uh -huh. I was waiting to join the Air Force. Uh, and I liked Curtis LeMay. Curtis, bomb him back into the Stone Age, LeMay. And he was my where, man. Look where you are now. Look where it got me. <laughs> and in the 60s, I understand you had uh, quite an interesting history. 60s history. Yeah. Well, um, I... You, uh, you talked about becoming politically aware. I think I probably became politically aware uh, with uh, the presidency of John Kennedy and actually his campaign even as a student. And um, I was a student. Uh, of course, I think most people that were conscious at that time remember what they were doing when he was assassinated. I was coming out of a PE class and found out in the locker room and um, stood in line with my boyfriend at that time for hours, for about four hours on a damp, drizzly night in November to get into the Capitol Rotunda where his uh, casket lay in state with a flag draped over it and uh, circle around it once wow. and leave. Well, let's see. When uh, JFK was shot, I was going to Catholic school. Mm -hmm. I was a real little kid. And where were and, you? And uh, this was in Panama. I was mm -hmm. going to a... Catholic school in Panama in the Canal Zone, and some kid came running through saying, oh, the president's been shot. And like, this is a Catholic president, first Catholic president. Right. These nuns, I think it was like an order from Boston, so they mm -hmm. were just like totally into the Kennedys. And the nuns were just like, that's a blasphemy, you know, you're going to go to hell for saying that, because they didn't know it was true. They just thought it was a rumor. Oh, wow. So then when it finally sank in that actually the president had been <laughs> shot in Dallas, mm -hmm. uh, I think we got the news like at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. All I know is that we spent the rest of the day on our knees on, on the cement floors saying the rosary I don't know how many times. Mm -hmm. But uh, like you said, anybody uh, who, was, uh, who had a pulse knew exactly where they were during, yeah. during that event. Yeah. A that, very sad uh, event. Yeah, something uh, I don't think any of us will ever forget. And then uh, I think my... Next big political awakening was with the Vietnam War. I had friends and uh, cousins who mm -hmm. went to Vietnam, and um, I was very much against our involvement in Vietnam and became a part of the anti-war movement. Uh, moved into a commune in Northwest. A commune? Holy yeah, cow. in Northwest D.C. You're, you're one of these uh, people that my parents warned me about. <laughs> Don't hang out with those people that, that go in communes and hippies. And, and look what you're doing. And look what I'm doing now. <laughs> you know, I was like, geez. If I would have been a hippie when I was young, I'd probably be a, uh, you know, a nice uh, <laughs> success today uh -huh. instead of uh, a host of a TV show. But no. hey, I'd rather be a host of a TV show than a success any day. Right. I guess. You could be both. <laughs> I could be both, but I don't know if I can be it on this TV show. But let's find out. Well, What's next on the... 
Uh, next, we are adding a fourth of a cup of whole wheat flour. Okay. So we'll just put that right in, and you keep mixing because you do that well. Thanks. And um, so, yeah, I moved into a commune in northwest D.C., and at first we were a working commune, just trying an alternative lifestyle. There were couples and single people that uh, lived in the commune. And, uh, now, you were li this was like an urban commune versus the rural. An urban commune, right. So um, everybody had like uh, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday jobs or stuff like that, and they would... No, uh, actually we all... Well, there were a few people that had eight to five jobs. There was a school teacher mm -hmm. that lived in the house. There was a telephone operator. But most of us actually made our living by selling an underground newspaper called wow. the Quicksilver Times. The Quicksilver right. Times. Right. One of the guys in the house was on this newspaper staff, and uh, we made money by selling that on the streets of D.C., mostly in Georgetown. And you'd just be uh, hawking Quicksilver Times, five cents or whatever? Mm-hmm. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, I think it was more than five cents, but uh, say 25 cents, 25 something cents. like that. Yeah. And you were able to make a living doing that? Yeah, we did. And um, How's my mixing? It looks great. Let's, put, let's uh, soften that up a little bit, and we'll put a half a cup of oil in. Okay. How about some oil? Oops. Peace oil. Peace oil. Okay. I'll let you do the measuring. Okay. Okay, now peace oil is very hard to find, but yes. if you can find it, definitely buy it. Steer clear. <laughs> okay, looks good okay. to me. Good to me, too. All right, and um, so this uh, working commune, um, we were just going along our merry way, and... Uh, all of a sudden, Rennie Davis moved in across the street. Now, I should say, at the same time, there were other things going on. Kent State happened um, right around the time that I actually moved into the commune. And uh, some of the people had friends that were involved with uh, the Black Panthers. And uh, consciousness was up. It sounds like consciousness was really up in that household. It was household. really up, right. And um, Rennie Davis, who you might recognize as being one of the Chicago Seven, the, the people that caused a disturbance in the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago. The ones that nominated a pig for president. Right. Okay. Uh, he moved in across the street, and um, some of us became friends with him, and we became involved in planting, planning an anti-war demonstration, which became the May Day demonstration of 1971. Now, the May Day was like the big anti-war demonstration. Right. And you were involved with that? Yes, I was involved with uh, that. Now, FBI agents, <laughs> CIA agents, please don't tap my phones. She's just my sound person, okay? I have nothing else to do with her. Well, okay. as a matter of fact, our phones did get tapped. I wouldn't doubt it at all. <laughs> by the FBI, and we were followed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were one morning about 6 o'clock, we were dragged out of our house uh, by the FBI, who broke into the house. They were looking for a particular individual who um, they said had been involved with uh, the New York bank bombing. Now, we didn't really know this person. Apparently, she was a friend of a friend's or something like that that had stayed overnight at the house. But she was, uh, I think, long gone by the time they got there. However, we found, we, finally someone had the presence of mind to ask them if they had a search warrant, and they did not. And they left and came back later in the day uh, with a search warrant. But by that time, everyone had made other plans for the day. <laughs> and decided, well, let's, let's go walk the dog and we'll right. come back next week. Right, okay. exactly. So that it was, sounds exciting. Yeah, it was an interesting time. And, um, if you had a chance to do it all over again, would you do it all over again? I, I definitely would. I definitely would. It was, it was uh, just a unique experience, and it was, um, you know, part of history, really. Um, I have to say, if I had it to do all over again, there were, uh, there were a couple of things I would do a little differently. Besides being so focused on demonstrations, I think that I would also have tried... Um, 
other methods for uh, affecting change because there's more ways to affect change than just demonstrations. I think I would have worked more closely with some of the Vietnam vets that came back, um, especially I'm talking about the ones that were traumatized that were yeah. in places like Walter Reed Hospital. Um, and, um, you know, just maybe done other grassroots things besides demonstrations. But I would have also done that along with everything else. And I, and I met some wonderful people and some very unique people. I can imagine. That was uh, some, uh, probably some of the most interesting times, I guess, in our nation's history mm -hmm. would be uh, the 60s, because it's always like the 60s are looking at a historical perspective. Right. Then I guess the other time in the history was maybe the Roaring Twenties. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff going on there. The Gay Nineties and um, just you know just times when there's a lot of social change and social right. ferment and stuff like right. that. Right. Civil War. All right. So walking up and down Wisconsin Avenue, Quicksilver <coughs> Quarter. Uh, well, actually, stay being stationed on, at a street corner. Uh huh. My station was down in Georgetown uh, at the intersection of Wisconsin and M, right there where that, the big that, that bank big, with the uh, gold domed bank gold -domed is, which bank hasn't is. changed. And yeah. know, I think the clock is still broken on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, do we? How is this going? Yeah, on? you're you're doing a great job, and um, now we need a teaspoon of salt. Um. And. There it is. and one tablespoon of vanilla. We have some vanilla right which there. Which I have measured out. Okay. Pre-measured vanilla here. Pre-measured. Okay, and keep stirring. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Earth Mother. <laughs> So you lived in a commune. When I was growing up, I was like, "Gee, I'd love to be a hippie, live in a commune." Instead, really? it was uh, Curtis LeMay. <laughs> Curtis LeMay, hey. Uh huh. And ROTC, and yeah. uh, I volunteered for NAM. But by the time I was uh, all set to go, the uh, the war had ended. Mm -hmm. So I spent uh, my four years in the military in Southern California. Mm -hmm. But. Um, when I went in, I, I wrote uh, Ho Chi Minh a letter saying, you know, I'm here in Southern California. Don't even come this way. And the Viet Cong never invaded Southern California. So obviously somebody read that letter. Well, I'm sorry that you were disappointed. But, you know, in a way, I think that you were lucky because uh, the, the men that I, that I know that did go to Vietnam and came back, a lot of them were traumatized oh, yeah. for years and years. Some of them are still traumatized. I mean, no doubt about really... It really messed up a whole generation. How is this coming along here? Uh, I would think it needs to be stirred just a little bit okay. more. And then we're going to spread it out on two cookies. Do we sheets. do anything with the uh, sugar there? Uh, yes, we should add the sugar. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I'm <laughs> just... Uh... Let me stir this up because it's okay. gotten a little thick here. Well, you know, actually... Uh, when I went into the service, I was, uh, you know, pretty much all-American boy. But mm -hmm. being in the military certainly radicalizes a person. Mm -hmm. uh, just being there into that sort of society, and then tr deciding to start trying to find out about the real world, mm -hmm. and also just doing some reading, uh, it was certainly an eye-opener. So. Yeah, I think especially at that particular time in, um, in our country's history, more so than, say, World War II, where yeah. that was a common cause and a common enemy and uh, an obvious evil. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me uh, stir this up some more. And if I had to do it all over again, I would certainly pass up on my military experience. It's the longest four years of my life. Plus, you had to wear your hair short all the time. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, we got a real interesting video of the 60s coming up. Let's roll them. See you soon with some more granola. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. President.
this car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. It, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. I'm in behind the motorcade. Now you follow them. It looks as though they're going to Parkland Hospital. In order simply to um, express a cry of anguish about what we believe to be an immoral and a self-defeating course, which our country finds itself increasingly bogged down in in Vietnam. You're being effectively counterpicked by an almost equal number of people. Reverend Reynolds, what is the difference in the opinion of your group and that one across the street? Well, about as much difference as day and night. They believe the war in Vietnam is immoral and inhuman, and we believe it's essential to defend our freedom and to uh, keep our word and our commitments made to the South Vietnamese. In a supercharged atmosphere, sparks of racial antagonism flared into violence. Firemen turned their hoses on the angry crowd. Police dogs were brought in. In five days, about 2,500 Negroes were arrested. They filled the jails and other detention quarters in what Dr. King calls fulfillment of a dream. The leaders of North Vietnam consider the march on the Pentagon tomorrow as much of their war effort as the guerrilla warfare in South Vietnam and the North Vietnamese Army assaulting our troops on the battlefield. Those who participate in these demonstrations tomorrow will be, in effect, cooperating with and assisting our enemy. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. That was quite a video. It sure was. Brings back those memories. It sure does. Well, while the video was going on, let's tell the folks at home what we were doing. Okay. We were spreading the granola on cookie sheets and preheating the oven to 350 degrees. Right. I'll put one last spoonful here. And if you would put it in the oven. It smells good. All right. Great. It's supposed to smell good. And we're going to bake it in a preheated 350 degree oven for 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Do we have time to do it in 20 minutes? The show's almost over. Well, through the magic of the 60s and television, we will do it before the end of the show. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wizard. We just have to repeat the magic words of the 60s. Okay. Richard Nixon. Is... No, that's not the magic words. No, okay. no, no. Peace. Peace. Love. And granola. granola. All right. And the magic words work. Far out. Uh-oh. Hey. It's the world-famous producer of the Politically Correct Cooking Show, Jay Tomlinson. Hey, Hello. Jay. How Hi. you doing? Okay. Glad you could make it to the show. Pretty good. I know. Thanks. This is good. So, Jay, what were you doing in the 60s? Well, actually, my brother and I, Joel, were both born in the 60s in Waco, Texas. Wow. Cool. That's political, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, you had an exciting time. What are you doing now, Marlena? Well, um, actually, I went underground for a while, uh, a little paranoid about things, and came back in the 80s and worked for a grief and loss organization called Sina. And now I co-produce a show here at Channel 10 called Woman's Side, which motivates women to recognize their leadership potential and take positions of leadership. It's on 930, 9.30 the first and third weekends of the month, 9.30 p.m. on Sunday nights. It's repeated Tuesdays at 11.30 and Thursdays at 5 p.m. We definitely have to write that down. Woman's Along side. with the recipe. <laughs> this is great granola. Mmm. How do you like it? Let me try it. I think I did an excellent job with the granola. Great. If we can work our cards right, we can eat all this granola before any of the other crew gets a chance at it. Well, let's try real hard. Those people at the farm knew what they were doing. Mm. <laughs> it's so good. I'm not sure it with anybody. Mm. So, 
Let me tell you a little bit about this jewelry that I especially. Uh, hey, well, Black where are you coming from? Hey. Let us get some of this food. Hey. Yeah. Mm. hey. Come on and try some of this. Who's watching the, who's watching the cameras? What's going on? We got on? a hungry crew here. And brownies, too. And brownies. All right. Real 60s food. <laughs> Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see y'all later. So long. Peace and love and granola. Peace. Bye.